different location actually at my kids' school where I also teach a couple days of the week to be able to bring to you another episode of Behind the Sermon. And let's kick that off with our first opening segment, which is the Fast Five. So the most interesting thing that happened this week was my birthday, all right? I turned 41 years old, whole lot more gray hairs than normal, but hey, I'm liking the salt and pepper look. Um, but uh, a couple things about uh, this week. So first off, just highlighting, I love these headphones. These are my Tozo uh, noise canceling headphones. They're like 30 bucks. I mean, they were really, really good. I use these all the time for work, like when I'm here and I just kind of, or need to work outside, I just put these in and bro, everything just kind of fades away. I lock in, zone in. And so this is something that is a part of my work week every single week. Helps me to focus both here, anywhere really, and at home, it's a big deal. Um, but like I said, this uh, week was my birthday and it was a couple of things. I gave myself a gift and it was working on and accomplishing a ministry online digital library. So the way I look at it was, it's kind of like I made a Netflix or I'm making a Netflix for our church creating all these online training videos for different ministries. So as a pastor, I get to speak into the foundational elements for a lot of our teams, kind of giving that framework. I created 40 videos, all right? All anywhere ranging between uh, mainly like four minutes to 10 minutes, I think the most was 20. But I created 40 videos on my 41st birthday. And so that was really cool to be able to kind of clone myself, duplicate myself and be able to share just things that I've learned from my dad and from our elders and leaders and from school. So that was really cool. I'm excited to kind of roll that out soon. Uh, other thing about this week, man, was uh, I got to serve uh, my in-laws and my parents on my birthday. Uh, you know, Alicia killed it with making an insane fresh onion, uh, well, fresh, she made it from scratch, uh, French onion soup is what I wanna say, really, really good. And we paired the French onion soup with a Monte Cristo sandwich that I made on the griddle. So that was kind of cool to uh, do that. Normally on, a, you know, it's your birthday, you know, you they take you out to dinner, but I just wanted to do that. So that was really fun. I love Monte, the Monte Cristo sandwiches because A, they're good, sweet, salty, savory, all those. But at the same time, The Count of Monte Cristo is my favorite uh, nonfiction book. All right? It's the first book I ever uh, kind of really fell in love with reading. And so that was cool. So it's kind of like an ode to that. Uh, we ended the day watching Mission Impossible. Another thing I love to do, it's my guilty pleasure, is just zoning out and watching uh, a good movie. So we saw the newest one, Mission Impossible Part 1. It was almost three hours long. Uh, did not know it was a part two, but I guess I have to wait. So that was really cool and got to watch uh, with the kids as well. And I love recommending movies. And at the end, the kids are like, you know, at the beginning, they're like, mm, it's going to be lame. And at the end, they're like, all right, that wasn't that bad. So those are always really cool uh, recommendations. But my favorite thing that happened my birthday week, probably outside of spending, first off, spending time with my most uh, favorite person, which is Alicia, um, spending time with God and the devotional that I'm reading, which I've been sharing those. My favorite devotion of the week happened to be the one that landed on my birthday, February 24th. And it talked about how unshakable God is and that in essence, even if the world, no matter how world or how much the enemy tries to shake God, it will not alter, not a letter nor a line that he is drawing. And that was, oh my gosh, like sitting in this car and that seat over there, I had to highlight books and read when uh, getting, you know, Alicia was working or doing something and I'm along with her and I would do a lot of highlights and study in the passenger seat. And I hated it when there was a bump or a turn in which my line and I missed it or, or it didn't look as pretty, you know, it kind of really bothered me and triggered me. I don't know why it did. Um, and but just to know that all the things that happen in this world does not shake God's hand and it keeps, again, uh, keeps him from not messing up, not a line or a letter of what he's drawing. So that was really cool because that encouraged me for obviously preaching the next day because uh, I don't preach perfect. No one does. And to know that even my shaky preaching uh, will not alter a line of what God is going to do through his word. So that was really cool. So that is my fast five for the week. And now another part, another one of my favorite segments of Behind the Sermon, which is the editing floor. Now, there wasn't a lot when it, came, when it comes to uh, preaching on Paul's relationship and how the gospel is supposed to be reflected in the relationships between kids and uh, parents. 
Uh, there were some things I want to say that I, I, I communicated everything that I felt needed to be communicated from the text. Um, obviously, I could have gone to Colossians and other places where Paul highlights those. Uh, you know, we went a little bit into Deuteronomy. Uh, there was one that actually I'm going to mention in the um, sitting with the Sotolongos that I did not mention. Uh, so that is part of the editing floor that made it into that segment, which is coming up next. But the one thing that almost made it in, which I'm glad I took it out, it would have been too much. But that's what this is for, was observing the dynamic between Jesus and his mom. You know, because there's one moment at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. This is found in John chapter, let me see, John chapter, where is it? Uh, John chapter 2, where uh, there is a wedding and Jesus has an interesting interaction and people kind of like have weird contributions to this. In fact, I'll read part of it. Ju uh, John 2, 1 says on the third day, keyword third day of the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee, which I got to go last year in Israel, Jesus's mother was there and Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. And then he continues on to be able to share and say that uh, obviously there was an issue with the wine there. They ran out and Mary interjects and Mary goes to Jesus and says, uh, in essence here, let me, let me find the verse for you. I lost my Wi-Fi. Let me see if I get it back. And Jesus goes and says, Hey, they, they have no wine. All Mary says is they have no wine. And Jesus replies back. A translation says, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, obviously you can see why this was going to take time because that sentence needs explanation. And I've heard many times I heard uh, jelly roll, which is a famous musician. Now talk about this and misrepresent this because pastors and others have misrepresented this. So many people, because it's very easy when we read in English, we read it with an English tone. So I'm sure, you know, you might've heard it. See, Jesus looking at his mom say, uh, woman, uh, what does this have to do with me? Like Jesus has an attitude, but then we have to ask, does Jesus sin? Um, has Jesus ever sinned? Is he dishonoring his mother? Because in this relationship, children honor your father and your mother. So I wanted to look at how does Jesus honor, how did Jesus honor his mom? Did he? Because that sounds dishonoring. And did the, how did Mary as a parent, you know, was she faithful in that interaction? Because she has an adult son at this point, being Jesus. Her husband's no longer um, in the picture. Joseph at this point has passed away. And so when you look at it, there was some very, very interesting things that, that I wanted to explain briefly. So first off, um, the problem. All right. Why did they run out of why did they run out of, of wine? Well, one speculation, which you always have to be careful with speculations, is that uh, the, the couple was poor. You know, Jesus was not rich. And so if Jesus is invited, Mary's invited. The chances are this might be one of Jesus relatives. And so close friends, more than likely a relative. And if they have a poor family, then they ran out. And, and in the Jewish culture, it was embarrassing um, for this. I mean, this was a scandal. Like Mary is very concerned for this person because if they find out there's no more wedding, I mean, there's no more wine, this is, this is going to be embarrassing. And by the way, the wine back then was not as high proof. I mean, as it is today it was fermented, but it wasn't, the, it wasn't the same. And so you had to really drink a lot in order to get, uh, you know, or a certain kind in order to get really get sloshed. And so some actually think that Mary, because she's kind of looks like she's taken upon herself, that she might be the host. She might be the host because she understands she's in behind the scenes. And if it's the host, then could it be one of Jesus's brothers that is getting married, which is interesting. That's why maybe Jesus is the, um, there. And even when he says that my hour has not yet come, almost like one idea is like saying, was well, Jesus talking about his hour, like, you know, his return and what he's going to do because he has yet to start his ministry. This is what launches it. Or is it the hour of his toasting? Like my hour, it, my turn in this participation is not yet. I, I, I'm supposed, you know, being Jesus, the rabbi. And if he was a guest of honor, he would have been asked to toast the couple. So we don't know. All of these things are left I don't know. So it's cool to think about, but we don't want to make big deals and put big theologies and, and, you know, our understanding or applications on guesses. What do we know? All we know is that Mary does not dictate and tell Jesus what to do. Mary just presents a problem, which is really cool. Mary presents the problem and she doesn't present the solution. Only just says, Jesus, we got a problem here. And Jesus's response 
is actually not one of disrespect. When he says woman, what does it have to do with me? No, and the word woman is this term that actually means madam. And so it's it's a respectful, like ma'am. And so it's super respectful. It is not disrespectful. And in essence, what does this have to do with me is not this like, listen, leave me alone. I'm trying to have fun and kick back and relax. I don't wanna work, you know? That's not it neither. But the implication that my hour has not yet come, what does this have to do with me? He is asking, he is asking Mary to explain her, the purpose. Like, okay, like there's no wine. So why does this bother you? Or what is your motivation, you know, behind this? And so he's just asking his mom in a very respectful way, just some clarification. And so uh, she goes and says, hey, whatever he asks you to do, just do it. So notice again, she's not putting any pressure on Jesus. And Jesus is not like, oh, all right, well, all right, my heavenly father had a different timetable, but my mom here, you know, I got to speed things up. See, interesting, Jesus goes and waits and and he waits till all the wine is gone, which at this point it is. And he goes to cisterns that were made to fill the water for purification. And they're completely empty. He says, fill them to the brim. And once all six are filled to the brim, uh, an element, a sample is taken over to the host. And when he tastes it, he's like, oh my gosh, the, the, they saved the best for last. Like this was normally everyone gives the best at the beginning and instead offers very watered down cheap drinks at the end when everyone's already had their fun, maybe the little, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so, but to say, whoa, they've saved the best for last. And this is incredible, you know, and it's it's really weird to think that Jesus kind of did create fermented drink. Uh, but anyways, I, I digress. Um, it wasn't that bad. Jesus, you know, did not uh, cannot be blamed for anything. But what did he do? See that that um, the element again, notice that the mother did not impose. And and in the end, what she, Moses does, is what Mary does is she points people to Jesus. She says, listen, whatever he says, follow him. And those are words that we need to apply to us today. Hey, no matter what, whatever God says, whatever Christ says in his word, we are to follow it. Even if it's a little, you know, weird and mundane, like in this case, it didn't make sense. But what happened? What happened, um, whether this is the, you know, the present hour, the hour to return, all these things, uh, Jesus took, again, water meant for purification, transformed it and turned it into a cup of blessing. And that is, that was just a really cool thing. He took empty pots and transformed it. Um, and so really, this is just a, a cool example of, again, that dynamic, like Jesus did not disrespect his mother. He honored the, his, not only his mother, but he honored his heavenly father by doing something in a way to reflect the glory of God. And Mary did not um, stir up Jesus' to anger at that moment. Instead, uh, he encouraged him and just presented the problem and in essence, pointed to the solution. Guys, whatever, just look to Jesus. Look to Jesus, which is a great word for us in the sense that, uh, again, the same water of the word that purifies us, transforms us. I mean, the chemical molecular aspect of water to wine was, it went from simple to complex. And that's what, what happens. We are transformed from sinners to saints. And uh, gee, Jesus does that, which is really, really, really cool. Well, that was part of the editing floor. And now I want to bring you to my attention to, again, my favorite segment, which is hopefully it's yours, sitting with the Sotolongos. All right, welcome to another episode of Sitting with the Sotolongos. I'm here with my favorite person, Alicia. And so we are here talking about uh, processing how we want to practice what was just preached. And so this last week was something that hit very close to home and it was parenting and kids. And we have been officially parenting now for 14 years. Yeah, our oldest 14 is- 14 and a half years, 14 and a half years. Uh, 14 and a half years, we got three boys, 14, 12, 11. and 11. Okay, and so I, I feel like I'm gonna always mess one of those up. And so um, I was gonna ask you, what is, um, well, yeah, we're going to get, the, uh, I guess, uh, I was going to share with mine, like, what's the one thing, what's one thing that was memorable, random, and then what's the the thing that really hit home the most and how we can apply it. So there was one thing that I, uh, the, the most interesting thing when I was doing the Bible study and I wanted to share it, which was that very weird Bible verse in Deuteronomy that very stubborn and rebellious children got the death penalty. How do you, how'd you feel about that? Well, one, I, 
I was in the front row, like very front row. And I, it took everything in me to not turn around and walk, like st- look at all the kids that were in the room behind me. Be, be like, mm-hmm, you see? But I didn't do that. But that that actually was, in my head, I was just like, I want, these kids are probably like, thank God I wasn't born back then. Yeah, I mean, you, that was like, a, there were some people when we read that, there was an audible uh, yeah there was like a, <gasps> like audible sounds what? like what <laughs> what is that so to me that was memorable in the sense that i found something in the old testament that 100 percent applied and showed the connected and uh yeah the promise of a long quality life and what that was and that wasn't just life is going to go great for you but you're going to avoid the, a lot of those problems right and you know death and destruction that you can bring upon yourself and others and so to me that was a, a memorable moment uh to be able to have that was there another random one that you can think of um i'm trying to think too as there well there was one random that everyone started laughing and i now i can't remember and it was i want to say it was it was re- like towards i want to say towards the parents and everyone was laughing, but now I can't remember. Oh, that's going to bug me. I know. I know. Now we're going to have to go back and play. I know. I mean, w- was it a nervous laughter? No, it was a funny, like, <laughs> they were laughing. Now I don't remember why. I don't remember I'm why. trying to think, too. I feel like I'm going to have to, like, rewatch no. it and put a snippet of it. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Yeah, because I know, like, in those, I know that there's some things that we look, and, and sometimes, yeah, I get nervous laughter because it's like, you don't know what, how else to respond, but just, <laughs> you know. But then, yeah, there's some other things that are, which are always fun to be able to highlight those, uh, highlight the obvious comedy or obvious things that are there that we can laugh at ourselves, really. That's some of it, too. So I don't know if maybe by that point the parents were, um, you know, do you think it was maybe the one where being uh, the stirring up to anger, the instruct, the balance and instructing in love and um, I don't it's know. bugging me too. You made a joke. You actually made a joke and it made everyone laugh. Yeah, I made a joke. And, and so, so that was, like, it was a random, it was, it was a random yeah, like, was thing the, that was put in. I didn't plan that right, one. Right. And that's sure. what I'm saying. And it just, it was, I think a good moment to, because it was tense. It was a very, you know, it hit hard, I think more for the parents and the kids um, just based on the ages of the kids that were there um yeah for sure but i think for the parents it was very much a very um hit type of sermon um and so i think that that joke that's why it was a memorable one and i just wish i remembered the joke but i just remembered that everyone kind of laughed and was kind of like almost like a reset into getting back into okay we need we need to kind of break it's very tense okay let's take a break and then back into the situation yeah but i just we don't remember the yeah, because it, it, it hits the most for the adults that day because, because again, it's like not only it's those who are parents, but those who are parents, you know, had the double whammy of, you know, being parents and then also having that child experience, yeah. you know, and so that hit. And so even the adults that didn't have kids, you know, that that it was relative to them because they were processing that as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah so, OK, so now the, the application was. Do not stir up anger in your kids, but rather train them up in the instruction, train them up, uh, correct them in instruction in the Lord. So build them up. I'm sorry. Yeah. Build them up with correction and instruction in the Lord. So what's the um, what's the one thing that you felt that, uh, I guess, hit home the most for you? Definitely the don't stir them up in anger hit for me the most. Because um, honestly, it's not, again, it's not something that, as a parent, you want to do on purpose or that you intentionally do that when you're trying to give instruction. Um, but you know, when you're, when you've grown up a certain way and you're, you know, you grow up in a household in which you can't really ask questions as to, well, why do I have to do this? Or, or you're just told because I say so all the time, that's how I just grew up. I didn't think there was anything wrong with that necessarily, obviously, but then again, I didn't know what God's word said about parenting and raising kids in a, in, in God's, you know, word and, and to raise them up to, to love and to know who God is. So, um, I didn't come to know the Lord till I was 14. So growing up as a child, I just thought how my parents did it was normal and it didn't make me feel a certain type of way, but honestly, starting to raise my own kids, I, um, I can start to a little bit relate to man, what I just said. I probably could have said it differently because now I just probably made the situation worse, but I didn't know any better at the moment, you know, but yeah, it's just that. Wow. Yeah. Like just, I was just applying how I was raised in that moment, which wasn't always the right choice in that time. 
Yeah. And then even on the back end of even applying the stuff and like, that's even how you remember it. And right. likewise too. It's like how many times in the past in those moments that we weren't listening, like they were maybe, maybe they were trying and, yeah. and maybe they ended with, yeah. because I said so, right. because we didn't listen to the other 10 times yeah. or five times or what didn't want to. And so even our own collective memory, mm -hmm. you know, can be a little flawed too. Um, that's a hard one. I mean, I wish, but no, I know one of the things that, that hit to hard was when you, when doing the study with the men and the, um, I'm sorry, with the, the parents and the kids, seeing that in the context relationship between uh, husbands and wives in that uh, Peter talks about this in second Peter, he tells husbands to live in an understanding way. And that lines up exactly with Paul. He's just saying it differently where Paul says, uh, husbands, you got to live sacrificially and sanctifying. And so I was going to ask you, how did that feel? Because the the dynamic between the husband and towards the wife is how both mom and dad are supposed to be for the kids. Yeah. So how did how with your perspective, how did that feel to hear? I'm like, OK, my role in with this relation, my responsibility in this relationship, you have to respect this role, but then apply it together equally mm -hmm. in that role like how did how did that feel on well, your you know one i feel like it comes that whole thing kind of comes at full circle like you're i have to be the wife i need to be for him he needs to be the husband i need to be for him we need to be the parents we need to be for the kids so that they can be in our case the husbands that yeah. their future wives are going to need and it's just like it goes like it's just full circle um so that honestly was very interesting to me be like wow like it just it kind of like all just fits together because yeah, it's even that like the way they see you with me and me with right, you it's right. like helps We're, them see how i'm there how i need to be mm -hmm. and meaning how they need to be and then also gives them options on who to look for who to look for exactly and the, yeah and then uh, and then obviously collectively applying that see it's a little easier for me because in the same way in the same way that i'm supposed to be with you that's the same way i'm supposed to be with the kids yeah so it's kind of easier for me you know um if that makes sense, you know, but, but yours is a little tougher, you know, in the sense that, yeah, because there's I'm their mom, like, I'm supposed to be an authority figure. And even though like I am a, an authority well, yes. figure in their life, it's, I feel like, honestly, like it's hard because it's like, I'm, I don't know how to explain it. Like, it's a weird, it's, it is a weird dynamic to have. Yeah. With because them. that's what I'm saying is that what's hard for you in the sense of like, you just said you want to be that authority figure to them. Right. And sometimes it's not it's not easy or maybe consciously for for women to think about, not because of anything, but because, again, natural, you know, yeah. again, it's it's easy for me or because I get to do that. It's easier. And it's it would be easy for you to default to authoritative figure. Right. Instead of authoritative also, figure, right. like vice versa, you know, yeah. because copy paste. Yeah. Um, so that, but yeah, yeah that, no, that, was a, that was a tough one to like, a balance think about. That you have. I, I do have to have with them where I can be. I I. Hey, I am your mom and you do have to honor and, you know, obey what I'm telling you. But then there's also that side of me that I have to remember and I have to be aware of that. I'm also their, you know, their helper and they're in a way like. I have to be able to guide them gently through decisions and if they need my help, I'm there to help Yeah, type of thing. So let me on that one part, like so like with parents, like we're both supposed to learn to live with kids in an understanding way that's kind of what what paul is mentioning he says don't stir them up to anger meaning don't provoke them to wrath mm -hmm. meaning don't give them a right reason to be upset and that's a hard for, for, for parents because a lot of times a lot of the disrespect a lot of mm -hmm. disobedience is their frustration with yeah. what we've contributed to right you know and so how, what's so hard about taking the time to understand them because we want them just to understand us and be done. Right. So what's so hard about us trying to get to a place to understand them? I don't know. I don't know why what's so hard about it, to be honest. I mean, like, the I don't know, the flesh, I mean, I mean yes, just... outside of the flesh, I feel like that's like an obvious, like, yes, obviously we're human and that's hard. But I feel like sometimes it's like in the hustle and bustle of the day, you just kind of want to be like, listen, like we have things to do, yeah. you know, to take we don't five, got time to, explain. Yeah, to like sit here yeah. for 30 minutes to explain to you and talk to you about why this is benefit beneficial for you to listen when I tell you the first time or why am I asking you to do X, Y, Z chores or why am I asking you to, you know, why, why am I restricting your TV time or your 
you know, Xbox time? Why are these things beneficial to you? And, you know, I'm not doing it to be, you know, yeah. uh, to run your life and just to tell, be able to say, well, because I said so, yeah. but because there is a benefit to you, even though in their minds right now, they don't see it. They don't understand. They just think mom's trying to boss them around. Yeah. But there's not a lot of time in the day to stop and sit and talk about those, which I feel like we have been doing a, especially as they've been getting older, I think we've been doing a better job at taking advantage of our dinner times or our family nights when we try to sit or on our car rides. Lately, it's been on the car ride yeah. to school. Captive because, audience. Right. We <laughs> normally don't have music really playing all the time. Like we're just kind of like silent. Everyone's really tired. So we kind of try to take advantage sometimes too. Yeah. talk about hey guys last night this happened this is why we said this this is why we yeah, took or do away you understand or right, do you or remember do you understand yeah some of them do you right. remember because we talked about that and then we just bring it up again do you right. remember which is what uh actually the advice god inspires moses to give to parents in deuteronomy when he says and he tells them to instruct their you know instruct the kids very similar very mm -hmm. similar to the way paul instructs and obviously he's quoting paul is quoting moses in the old testament so it's very easy when in quoting and affirming moses kind of affirms all the other stuff and so moses would say to speak to the kids when they wake up when they go to bed when you're sitting idle and when you're on the road yeah so it's those little moments like those transition times of yeah you know first thing in the morning last thing um, hey, we're just hanging around dinner time. It's just right. sitting idle or we're driving in the car. Take maximizing those little moments yeah. is, is a big deal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I would say the hardest thing, because you, you said a big one. It's like, A, we either have little time or little patience. Yeah. And the patience is not necessarily like them. You know, it's mm -hmm. just life and everything else and other responsibilities. You know, like if 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 I wear out your patience and then uh, now they, you know, there's none left yeah, or, or right. if the, you're where we're jo working the, your job yeah, or you whatever home and you just had a, or a your own personal day. thing. Yeah, yeah. Your own personal thing you're going through the, um, I think for me, like the, the hardest part of being understanding is not wanting to recognize. And I know I said this in the sermon, this is for me, not wanting to recognize that the world they're living in is different than the one that we're oh, living so in different. because we understand our world because we grew it. We right. grew up in it. We, and we understand this world, but not at a different, yeah, yeah. in a different level than that, their eye, their eyesight. Right. That one was a hard part to be able because in the only way that you can understand this world is to ask questions. Mm -hmm. A, B, listen and C, be interested in what you're listening to. Yeah, and sometimes that's, that, that's the hard, being interested the last one is, the is very hard to be interested because some of their their versions of what entertains them or what they're into, I'm like, why? Like, I yeah, don't get or it. Just, but, but yeah, we have to kind of put on that face sometimes and be like, oh, yeah, that's cool, buddy. Great. I'm so glad that you got to. And I feel whatever. like a jerk the whole time. I know. I feel like a jerk because I'm like, I should care. I should want to care. But at least I count it as a win. I'm at least I am paying attention. I want to affirm you. Yeah. You know, at least because yeah. that's better than and that. And sometimes, but. sometimes like I do feel like we should ask like, what? Well, well, why is this funny to you? Because sometimes I'm hearing these jokes that they're listening to, and I'm like, that was like not funny. Why is this funny to you? Like, yeah. Trying to kind of understand where their sense of humor is coming from, yeah. or why? Like, because this is not just our kids. I feel like with all the kids we deal with, I'm like listening to them, and I'm like. I, yeah. I don't get it. But then again, our parents probably didn't understand mm -hmm. our entertainment or how no, what, what sure. made us funny way. or yeah. what made us laugh or why we used certain words to describe yeah. things like, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, every generation, I guess, is different. Yeah. And I think what our as parents is trying to get to really understand yeah, that that's instead of always putting them down, like all oh, these kids are going to grow up to be nothing. Or they're just lazy. They're just or lazy. They're just whatever. Getting to understand their generation. Yeah, and, and it's know, not always easy or interesting to do. But. Yeah, I know a lot of like Gen X and Gen Alphas and stuff like that. Even some millennials, like they get yeah. labeled as lazy or this or that. And then no, there and there's a lot of videos I know they're popping up. It's like no, it's not that we're lazy. It's just that we have. And then I've heard some people make some really good cases, and I'm like, all right. See, that's part of understanding, yeah. um, you know, again. And then it's hard for us because it's just like them. It's like I, I think it's kind of funny in that when we we want them to understand and, and notice again, like the dynamics, like the the natural man 
what was the de the default man? You know, wife, you serve me. Mm -hmm. And what's the default woman? You know, man, you respect me. Mm -hmm. But the very thing that God demands of us is the very thing that we're demanding of the other. And so, right. and I think parents are the same thing too. Like what parents are supposed to live in an understanding way, but parents want the kids, you respect me. Mm -hmm. And the thing that God, you know, that, that God demands of, of children, obey your parents. You know, the kids are telling the parents, you obey us, you know, right. kind of a thing. And so it, right. that's just the, the flesh and how it's crazy, how it's reversed. But, um, but yeah, I know, it, I know it's a tough thing uh, because sometimes it's hard to live in an understanding way because sometimes they can't understand us yeah. or don't want to. Right. But again, that's kind of that's where God's grace comes in is because we're supposed to be a kind of way, even if they're not. Yep. And that's the other thing. It's like I, sometimes I have, to, I have to try to put myself in when I like go backwards to when I was a kid and, and remember when I felt a certain way when my mom told me to do something or when I was grounded for something that I thought was I was being grounded for, you know, it was a ridiculous reason to be grounded. At least in my head, that's what I thought, you know, growing up now later, I'm like, yeah, I, that, I should have probably been grounded for that. But it's like, I also have to remember that, that my kids are where I was once at and I didn't understand everything my parents were asking me to do and why they were asking me to do it. And why I was being grounded for certain things. Like I didn't understand it when I was their age. I didn't, in a way, didn't. Yeah, I, I thought again. I, I think it was it a all. big mix of couldn't and didn't. Yeah. Like I think it's a. It's there's no way to tell the line yeah. between the two. So I just sometimes feel like if we, as parents, try to remember where we were. Yeah. When we were our kids' age and how we thought in those moments about yeah. what was happening in our household and how we were being raised i think that could help a little bit to yeah. even well and it also kicks in too when we remember our own relationship with god which is key yeah i mean it's like your relationship with god and your relationship with your spouse can then cascade into a relationship with the you know yeah so obviously the, those are important and even if this is not the one with god is enough to be able to have enough grace to be one way with the spouse and a different way with the kids and that's if there is no spouse on the other end yeah. depending on what you're watching because in the end parents were supposed we have the role of responsibility of reflecting god and christ in the relationship and what is god I'm talking about don't stir them up to anger meaning don't give them you know a reason rightful reason to be upset and how is god always described as being slow to anger and patient and abounding in love so for us to be able to that's the characteristics of christ so, yeah, so part of our own personal maintenance. I don't know if you ever thought saw that or I know, you know, it took us a minute to process, connect all that stuff. How is our personal private time with God actually indirectly shaping us to be the spouse and parent that we need to be mm -hmm. and not sleeping on that? And so, yeah, that's a big connection. So, all right. So application point. So we, the, you know, in the end, he says, don't stir them up and really build them up. And how do we build um, Don't tear them down, build them up. And how do we build them up? By correcting and instructing them in the Lord. So the correcting is negative, meaning right. tell them what they're doing wrong. But the balance of then instructing, which is the other things we were saying, which is instructing them, showing them why, or, or doing that with them, or this right. or that. So that's the balance. Right. And you know? I feel like also not just telling, but in action, them seeing us do yeah, what we're modeling. asking them to do. Yeah, like yeah. modeling it too. Yeah, of course, right. which, you know, don't you do it, but I can't do it right. myself. You know, like I actually caught Josue the other day. Literally yesterday, he was drinking out of uh, out of the jug, the gallon of tea. out of the jug. Yeah. yeah, so he was drinking out of my oldest was drinking out of the gallon of uh, of iced tea. And I said, the second I saw him, I was like, "Don't do that." And then immediately when I said it, I do it all the time. And so then I kind of said, "Don't do that." I'm the only one who can do that. Okay, I'm not gonna do that anymore because I then I was like very like I was exposed, you know, like saying. What's a rule for you, yeah. but not for me, do unless I, I have a rightful reason. And not as I do. Yeah, unless yeah. it's like, oh, rightful reason is I paid for it, so I can do whatever I want with it. That's whatever. You don't like the reason. That's my reason. You buy your own tea. I don't know. But so I caught myself on that. But I think we both agree because this is the one we've talked about the most is how to balance correction. Because we're, 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 I think, like most parents, we're quick to correct. Yeah. But we're slow to encourage. Yeah. So what are you thinking on for you on how to do? how to do that better um i'm trying to do better at when i 
instead of just correcting and just leaving it alone, I'm trying to correct, but in that moment, because sometimes I have a bad habit of correcting and then just like correcting and walking away. And then later on dwelling on like, maybe I should have like explained it in the moment why, instead of letting them try to ponder and in a way, like letting them in, in a, in a sense, dwell in their anger of being corrected or punished or whatever, like maybe at least giving an explanation for why. And I have also gotten to me for a place of giving a lot of warnings before, like, boom, like, hey, guys, you know, you're this is supposed to be done. Why isn't it done? Like trying to give them like soft before I go to the yeah. actual correction. Like, Which I just God kind did of, that like, a lot. Give them a little bit of a, hey, guys, you know, your bed's supposed to be done. Why isn't it done? Or, hey, yeah. you guys know this is not supposed to be here. Why is it here? Um, Kind of like before we get down to the punishment part of it or the the full on like you know negative side of it no i agree i mean like i said that, that is definitely in scripture like god always says hey if you do this this is gonna happen if you don't do this it's gonna happen yeah. and then when it was getting close it's like hey it's gonna happen yeah. it's gonna happen and then all right you're not listening yeah because so, so, i can yeah. admit i've been guilty when they were younger or especially like well probably wasn't a few years ago even to just they did the one i would give like one warning and or even not just the warning i would just like up oh, this is not done grounded for a week or this that and the other i would be quick to sweeping declaration literally yeah, yeah. like chop it off we're done um so i've been trying to grow in more patience and trying to grow in more um grace with them yeah i, I would say and i know this is something we both talked about um and then i'll say on the on the personal end um in a sense of let me let me give the positive in hopes like the thing that i i feel like i need to i want to improve on better with the hopes of this one thing kind of being affected and again it's doubling down on seeing my own personal time with god in my own devotional reading my own bible study my own all these things making sure that i'm not just getting in god's word but that god word god's word is really getting into me and that it's informing me you know like not just informing my mind but forming me on the inside out because the only way that i can have that grace that's an overflow that that's a deep that, that's the indirect result of this so in, i guess in my mind if i'm seeing if i'm seeing a pattern of yo i'm being very impatient yeah. then I, yo, I need to spend more time i need to spend maybe a little bit more time with god maybe more quality time maybe my because i know sometimes i've admitted it was like yo i spend the time with god but you know, I'm listening to the audio Bible, but I'm also checking my email. So I'm doing quantity time, but is it quality? Yeah. And so maybe I need to revisit, yo, am I spending good quality time or is it quantity time or is there something else? And I think that's the other part is that I know that me when and you've admitted this too, like in the sense that part of our frustration is not so much that they're not getting it. But part of our frustration is because they're not getting it. It's almost like affirming we're not we're good not, parents right we're failing yeah and so it's like our frustrate like their inability or their inconsistent or the fact that they're doing something again and again and again mm -hmm. it's hard for us to be able to embrace listen sometimes they're learning and you don't people don't do things yeah. get it right all the time right but them repeating actions or them doing something not i guess trying not to see that as a indictment right on us right and not taking it so personal, because if it doesn't take if, if we can find our affirmation in Christ, which there it is, then ho I don't need to find that as my affirmation, which then hopefully that's my thinking process that if I'm less frustrated, I'll have more grace and patience to do excellent like what we were talking mm -hmm. about. So, yeah, something else. Thinking about. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, that's parenting right there. And so, I mean, I get it. Do you get it? Why when Paul would say is like, hey, when you, you know, think about it when you're going to get married. And thinking about when you have, when you're gonna have kids because you're just adding, you're willingly adding stuff to your life. Yes, yes. Which is good for you, great for you, but like anything, it's like it's work that takes, but yeah. it's worthwhile work. But yeah, like actually it reminds me of something that um was told to a friend of mine um years ago. Like I think we were we were newlyweds, and this person told one of my friends, like, you know, who was newlywed i think i think they were newlyweds at the same time they were trying to you know start a family and um there was some a little bit of a pro, not a 
I guess some, a little bit of problems in the marriage, but nothing like crazy. The advice that they were given was pretty much, oh, just have kids. I don't, you know, make everything better. It's going to make, you know, it's going to complete your family. And, you know, it kind of makes all the problems go away. And I'm like, what did they tell you? And that time I didn't say it right then. But the more I, when I started having kids, that advice was like, it like shot to the front of my front, to the front of my head. And I was like, who, I would never give that advice to anyone. If you're having issues in your marriage, do not bring kids into that because it only will make it m- harder. It's not. Yeah, it's not the magic pill. It, it is, is not, not a magic, Messiah. magic yeah. little wand that's going to no, yeah. because parenting is. It's hard. Yeah. It's, it's a it's cool hard. It's but a it's cool a, blessing it because is. it gives you that element of like it's hard to know. Or it's one way where you can know the heart of God. I was just going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Because being a parent immediately puts you in his shoes that's why it's so hard because you know to do it well it is which then at the same time it should lead us to worship god and that he is a good father and like look at this is bro who can be perfect and then i was like wait our heavenly father is and so and then the fact that i don't i know we talk about jesus literally being our perfect sacrifice like he lived the life we could not live so that we can enjoy the life we don't deserve but I don't know if the father gets as much credit. We don't may think about it as much. Right. Our heavenly father has always been the perfect parent, meaning he's he was what we could not be. And that grace kind of covers all that stuff. So that's that's always something, you know, encouraging and that the blood of Christ then covers all the areas in which we suck at and fail that. So that's yeah. it. All right. Well, guys, thank you for joining us. And so I want to encourage you guys, if you have any questions of uh, resources, videos or books, you know, um, I don't know, I, I'd love to be able to. Uh, answer any questions. Uh, likewise, if you have any questions for Alicia, just drop them off in the comments and we'd love to answer those. Um, but until until next week. So guys, I want to encourage you with this word. I mean, check it out and look at that, man. The parenting relationship is a big deal. All right. For those of you that have kids, hey, you got a lot to work on. For those of you that want to have kids, see your interaction and relationship with your marriage as a means to do that. If And if you're single and want to have kids, then begin to live sacrificially in that way. Have God work in you to prepare you to be that spouse and then eventually that that parent. And for those of you that are adults and, and you've you got grown kids or no kids or grandkids, all of the supplies, live sacrificially, reflect Christ no matter who it is, pour into others, point people to Christ, most important thing, all right? So until then, guys, I wanna encourage you to always hold to the faithful word and God will do a faithful work in you. God bless you guys.